I'm quite interested in how folks find or create meaning in their lives. I'm not all that interested in the meaning of life. There are endless books on that subject, and every faith tradition has its own take on that. What I want to know, and what I find fascinating to explore, is how individual men and women find purpose in their own way. If you talk with two Presbyterians, chances are that you will find each follows a different path of meaning making. That's what I want to figure out. When I take a moment to actually see a face in a crowd of humans walking down the street, I think, well, to be very honest, my very first thought is, I wonder what they drank. That's a habit from my bartending days that I've not been able to shake. And that guy is definitely into scotch. But I digress. After this initial reflex is quickly exhausted, I turn to my current obsession, meaning making. I wonder how this stranger finds purpose. I wonder if she even thinks about this. One of my greatest fortunes is that my career surrounds me with coiled energy. As a professor, I get to spend considerable time thinking, talking, and writing about meaning. And more importantly, I get lots of opportunities to listen to people tell me about their own efforts to create or find meaning. I interact every day with emerging adults getting ready to fully enter the force field of life. This makes me check my assumptions. Some expect to find meaning in dramatic and loud ways, setting up NGOs in Africa. But others long for the white picket fence with annual trips to the Dells. For some, a meaningful life is about fulfilling God's will. And yet for others, God is but a figment of the imagination. So that's an insight that I keep in my back pocket, that the life paths to meaning making are many. But there are commonalities as well. I find that most adults seek meaning via generativity. Generativity suggests a desire to invest in the well-being of younger and future generations. It's about doing things that will help us to achieve symbolic immortality. It's about promoting oneself and helping the world at the same time. Like all animals, humans have a limited lifespan. Unlike other species, we know this. At 40, we know we have three or four decades remaining on Earth if all goes well. We are aware of our own finitude and so strive to do things to cheat this reality, to live forever. This is generativity. If I instill certain values in my daughter, then I don't really die. Those values live on in her. The woman who spends solitary hours making beautiful paintings, let's say she's not a parent, nor very socially engaged. Her meaning in life also flows through a generative stream. Future generations of art lovers will be moved by her product. School children will try to mimic her style. Without ever having met any of these people, she has benefited their lives. I've learned a lot about how folks create meaning by examining this idea of generativity. It seems universal, though I am cautious in making that claim. Adults, some more than others, produce meaning in life by being generative in some way. How are you generative? Your answer likely speaks to meaning making. Another way to examine this issue is to focus on specific types of people. I'm part of a huge team, core companions being Terry, Abby, and Jim, working with veterans who have survived spinal cord injuries, life-altering accidents resulting in paraplegia or quadriplegia. I study these adults because I think they represent all of us in a profoundly and microcosmic way. We all experience disruptions in life. How we make sense of these tragic events in our lives cuts to the very essence of meaning making. Listening to these life stories has been inspiring and humbling and even depressing. Through all of our analyses, I think two basic findings help me better understand this larger question of how folks find or create meaning in life. The first insight is that one's perception of reality completely trumps actual objective reality. One might assume that the guys with the worst injuries, those complete quadriplegics with no limb use, would be most likely to suffer from TTSD, depression, and general lack of well-being. But this is not at all true. The injury does not matter, but one's perception of the injury does. Those who interpret their injury as less severe are less likely to follow this dark trajectory towards post-trauma mental health decline. I suspect this is the same for those of us who have not undergone such dramatic life disruptions, but have experienced other disturbances and life troubles. It is the lens through which we see these things that shapes our well-being. The process of finding meaning in our lives is colored heavily by our basic optimism-pessimism. A second lesson learned from this group is that life disruptions may themselves deepen one's appreciation for life's meaning, as if meaning were always there, but it took a tragedy for one to discover it. A man confined to a wheelchair who has to relieve himself through a colostomy bag tells us that he's a better person now than he was prior to the accident. He appreciates his children more, thinks more about how to pleasure his sexual partner. He's less selfish, more grateful, less of an asshole. Here we learn that trauma, when processed in a certain way, actually has the potential to deepen one's meaning in life. I also study lesbians. I want to know how one can create a meaningful life when social messages and institutional policies condemn one as inferior, perverted, incomplete. Kim Skirvin and I measure how these women differ in terms of internalized homonegativity, the extent to which a lesbian incorporates negative social stereotypes 
into her own sense of self. The group we call transcenders fully acknowledge that this social oppression exists, yet this darkness never enters into their own identity. The occluders do indeed internalize these swirling negative images and so see themselves as somehow broken. By absorbing these social stereotypes, the occluders are blocked from leading full and rich lives. We have demonstrated that transcenders are much more generative. We also find that occluders indulge in substance abuse and employ immature defense mechanisms, avoiding the authentic quest for a meaningful life. The larger lesson drawn here is to see with clarity what culture values, but to forge oneself independent of any judgments, not to give others the power to reduce our value. One final group to mention are prisoners. The limitations of incarceration are profound, as are the insights I have gained from these adults. Creating a meaningful life is not about what you have done. It is not about physical conditions. It's not even about oneself. One must look beyond the bars and into the greater life forces. I've been to lots of churches, but my most spiritual moments have been in prisons. Inmates have taught me that the meaning is about redemption in their lives and in mine. Honest stock taking is painful, but it is important if one is to own past trespasses and to move towards the light. In fact, that simple phrase is a dynamic I observe in a great meaning makers that I encounter. Whether they be students, trauma survivors, sexual minorities, prisoners, or the general population, I find that people create meaning in life by moving towards the light. The light being individually defined as anything from spiritual enlightenment to yearly rides on the duck boats in the Wisconsin Dells. Thank you.